Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, it is such a delight to have everybody here this evening. We are so excited to have you here with us for the second in a series of webinars on an incredible paper, A Sacred Space, that was written by 12 authors, and two of those authors are here with us this evening, um, Abdul Wright and Dr. Leanne Stevens. And I can't wait for you to get to know them and benefit from the gift of their wisdom. Kristen, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. We are recording the webinar um, for those who were unable to join us this evening and also for the center at Albany State University to have for their records. So I just want everyone to be aware that we are recording. I'm asking you to please, if you have not already, completed the two question pre-webinar survey in SurveyMonkey. Literally, it takes less than one minute. I would ask that you go and do so now. And Kristen's putting the link into the chat box and it is also on the screen. We're going to ask you to stay muted until we go into breakout rooms when you will be unmuted but we do want you to have a healthy, robust, and rich conversation in the chat box. So please use the chat box with abandon. Kristen um, Record is our technology expert tonight, and Kristen, we're very grateful to you. I'd also like to recognize some of the authors and, and project team authors who are here with us this evening but are not presenting. And so Kimberly Worthy is here. Kimberly was one of our host educators on our first webinar. Joy Jones is a gift, um, as her name implies. She is just a joy to work with. And she is one of the staff members who works with Dr. Kathleen Mons at the Center for Educational Opportunity at Albany State University which commissioned and oversaw this paper. Kemi Iwell was our graduate student researcher and Peggy Stewart was our project manager. And welcome to all of you and Kristen. And it is now my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Kathalina Edward Mons, who is the CEO of the Center for Educational Opportunity at Albany State University. And Dr. Mons, the floor is yours. Thank you and good evening, everyone. And thank you for coming. And uh, thank you, Catherine, for your stellar leadership on this project. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Catherine at the Center of Advancing Opportunity Summit, in fact. Uh, and at that time, we had a chance to chat. And so we're delighted to engage you this evening. The Center for Educational Opportunity was founded in 2018 from a grant by the Thurgood Marshall College Fund's Center for Advancing Opportunity. And I'm excited to know, as I see in the docket of participants, Dr. Joyce uh, in Joyce Payne, who is the founder of the uh, Thurgood Marshall College Fund and Dr. Payne, and what a delight to have you present this evening, and we are uh, honored to have you. I'll pause, actually, Dr. Payne, if you'd like to render some words to the audience this evening uh, on behalf of TMCF. Is that something that you'd like to share? Well, I, I certainly won't hold the program up. I'm delighted to join you. I'm looking forward to the discussion. I hope I can make a contribution in some small way. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Appreciate it. And so when our center was uh, founded and when we started doing the initial work, one of the things that we wanted to make sure of is while we are a research center, we value the contributions that teachers uh, may provide uh, in, their, in their respective roles. And as such, our institution, while we provide research dollars to academicians, we also understand the value of hearing from teachers. Because a part of our center's mission is that we understand the importance of bottom-up engagement. And so what you'll hear tonight are uh, two stellar teachers in their own right. 
uh, Mr. Abdul Wright and Dr. Leanne Stevens, who will share with us some of the experiences and the work that they've been doing in the classroom as it pertains to race and inequity challenges. And so we now know now more than ever, it's important that we really find ways to um, reach out to students, particularly students in fragile communities. And so I'm gonna pause because you all are really uh, the show for the evening. And again, Catherine, thank you. You are just an amazing leader and our center is forever grateful for the work that you've done uh, and look forward to partnering with you in the future. Take it away. Thank you. It's, it's truly been an honor. Um, so why this paper? So Kristen, if you could go to the next slide. Oops. Um, so I think that we're missing a slide, which is fine. So why this paper? Um, this paper was so important both to the center and to me personally to do because it addresses a topic that I feel is, is under addressed. And that is how do we um, work with our students in fragile communities? How do we celebrate their resilience, their fortitude, their commitment, their determination, their pride? How do we honor that? And so we had 12 incredible teachers with us who were able to share with us their thoughts from communities that would be considered fragile communities. And these communities ran the gamut from rural Georgia to a reservation in Montana, to inner city North Minneapolis, to St. Louis Park, Minneapolis. These are the communities that Abdul and Leanne represent. All over the country, um, urban, rural, suburban, each different in their own way. But these teachers made the struggles, the challenges, and the triumphs that their students face on a daily basis so real for us. And that's why this paper. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers for this evening, our experts for this evening, um, Dr. Leanne Stevens, is a high achievement program coordinator in the St. Louis Park School District in Minnesota. And Abdul Wright is an eighth grade English language arts teacher and literacy coach in North Minneapolis, Minnesota. And our agenda, Kristen, Leanne and Abdul will each be asked two questions, um, one at a time, which they will answer. We will welcome comments um, in the chat box. We are going to keep everybody muted. We have 84 people who are supposed to be attending this evening. And if all 84 were speaking at once, that would be a little confusing for everyone. And then we will go into breakout groups, into two breakout groups, one with Leanne and one with Abdul. And we will come back together to share some final thoughts. So that is our agenda for this evening. And let's get started. So Leanne, um, I'm going to apologize to you because I sent Kristen the wrong deck. And so while this has the wrong question on it for you, I will ask you the right question. Okay. Leanne, um, you served as a racial equity coach. Why did you choose to do that? And what did you learn? Okay, thank you. Um, what an honor, first of all, it is to be a part of this webinar with the incomparable Mr. Abdul Wright. Um, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Joy. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Kathleena, Dr. Mons, um, and the other amazing educators who contributed to a sacred space. First, I just really want to pay homage to two educators uh, whose lived experiences impact me and impacted me immensely. And it was um, Nathaniel Burris and Aurelia Ruffin Cobb. And they were um, graduates of historically black colleges uh, and universities. Nathaniel was my maternal great grandfather and Aurelia was my maternal grandmother. And they are both, both are now my ancestors and their spirit lives in and through me. Um, Nathaniel graduated from Morehouse College in hopes of becoming a math teacher. That was his dream, but it never 
um, came to fruition. And so in order to provide for his family, he did what a lot of black men did in the 1920s and he worked for the railroad. Um, Aurelia did become a teacher, but didn't get paid for the first five months because apparently there was one required course that she still needed to take. Mind you, they didn't tell her that when they hired her though. Um, and so she went to work every day as if she were getting paid. And finally, her parents were able to put together enough money to pay for the course that she needed. And she did receive back pay. And I guess that was the least they could do. Um, but it's important for me to remember their stories and speak life to their stories because their stories weren't told um, while they were living. And their story is my story. As any teacher knows, it's really difficult to make the decision to leave the classroom. Uh, and actually, that was never my intention. Ten years ago, I had my classroom set up and ready to teach fifth grade. And then a colleague at our high school called me to let me know that there was an opening for a director of students position and I should apply. And so I was really hesitant, but he continued to like push me towards it and, you know, tell me, oh, you know, we really need you there. And so I relented. And so I realize now that sometimes it takes others to see leadership capabilities in us when we don't necessarily see them in ourselves. Um, but I only remained in that position for one year and actually I wanted to quit within like the first month. Um, but it just, it wasn't my jam. It was, I felt like I, being like punitive with scholars just wasn't my thing. And so I was gonna go back to the classroom after that. But another position, uh, was brought to me and that was the high achievement program coordinator which I'm going to discuss a little later but I did that for four years and then applied for and accepted the role as racial equity instructional coach and so I wanted to combine my passions which were um, which was or which still are instruction and racial equity and I thought I could do that while coaching 40 plus teachers I was part of an interracial group because no, no one racial group can do this alone. Like, um, we need each other to advance the work. I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher helping teachers to be champions of racial equity in their professional lives and their personal lives because it really has to, I believe, it needs to be personal before it can really take root um, and transform, transfer into our professional lives. I'm a teacher helping teachers to show up as their authentic selves every day. And as a racial equity instructional coach, I implore teachers to examine their belief systems and how they were racialized growing up because we teach to our beliefs, therefore we teach who we are. And when I talk, like think about what did I learn from this role? Um, a lot of things, of course, we don't have all that time for me to tell you everything, but learn that race matters, whether we believe it matters or not. Um, one of my racial equity colleagues would always say like whenever humans are gathered race is present too uh, our beliefs matter they shape how we show up in the classroom as teachers and scholars it's imperative that we know what we believe about people who do not look like us or share our same experiences teachers will teach who they are whether they're aware of it or not and i believe that racial biases rear their ugly heads from our life's experiences which tend to be a result of a false dominant narrative that centers around whiteness and most times an irrational fear of people who don't look like us, particularly black people. Therefore, it's important to have conversations about race with our teachers and with our scholars. So much of the racial bias comes from not having relationships, I believe, not having relationships with, with black, indigenous, and people of color. We are racialized beings, y'all. However, when I've asked like white people when they first recognize race, it almost always involves recognizing someone else's race, um, that of a non-white person. White people have a race and their race has benefited them throughout history. In Minnesota, we do a pretty decent job of educating white students. I kind of still feel like we, don't, we can't like pat ourselves on the back because we could do better with them too but I believe that we do a better job of educating them because the majority of our teachers are white and they can see themselves in white students. So even if they aren't achieving at high levels, they believe they should be, so they teach to that expectation. I have witnessed teachers teaching to a lower expectation for our black indigenous students of color. Our disparities reflect that, like Minnesota is one of the uh, worst states. 
um, with our racial disparities. Schools are not impervious to the racial and cultural biases that play out in society. I mean, those attitudes creep their way into the classrooms and our black indigenous students of color are often on the receiving end of those negative attitudes. And once those negative attitudes are uncovered, the work of racial equity transformation, I believe, can occur. When we acknowledge our perfect imperfections, we can then be vulnerable and see the brilliance that all of our scholars bring into our space. This work can be exhausting because it also relies a lot upon self-reflection, but we have to do the work for the sake of our humanity and that of our scholars. I always like to say that it's hard work because it's heart work. Thank you. Leanne, thank you. Um, and I know that we've had some conversations about the work that you do and the difficulty in helping people to recognize their own biases and that when you're doing this work, you're looking at it as raising bias awareness. You're not expecting to do a biasectomy, if you will, um, but you're, you're really working to help people understand that they have these biases. And once they recognize that, they will hopefully be able to address them. Would that be accurate? That would be accurate, absolutely. And it's liberating too. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some freedom in that. Absolutely. You don't, to, you don't have to hold all that stuff in. Absolutely. Know thyself. So Abdul, let's move on to you. Um, what within your own childhood experiences led you to choose teaching as your profession? Um, first and foremost, good evening, beautiful people. Um, thank you. Catherine, thank you, Dr. Stevens, my hero, my role model. Shout out to Jess. I just saw you pop up in the chat talking about how Dr. Stevens is your role model. Y'all both mine. Um, I, I think for me, what within my own childhood experiences has led me to choose teaching as my career. I think the more I think about this, I used to tie it to like mistakes and grace and, and knowledge and all of these different things. But I think the common thread is identity. And when I think about the power of identity, I think about how identity is shaped and how my identity has been shaped and nurtured and cultivated over the course of my entire life. Um, you see it play out in, in our class. You see it play out in our communities, first and foremost. Like I was, a, my identity was a product of my environment, my 100% identity. So early on in my childhood, I was a product of where I came from. And so coming from poverty, living in a fragile community, um, growing up in a culture where it's, where it's just, you know, you, you, it's a survivalist mentality. You you grow up and you start to think like, my, I got to just survive. Like, I got to think about right now. I got to think about the right now. I got to think about the tomorrow. So you end up in positions where you're not thinking of benefits. And I had so many people in my life who pushed me to say, you know what, you're making a lot of mistakes because you don't see you. You don't have a, a good enough understanding of who you are yet. And when I think back, I used to always want to be everybody else but me. I used to want to be my favorite basketball player. I used to want to be my favorite drug dealer down the street. I used to want to be like my favorite teacher who grew up in the suburb. I used to want to be a combination of all of these people, but the last thing I wanted to be was myself. And because of that struggle with my identity and that constant questioning myself and never having any answer, I found myself caught up in situations that I really didn't need to be in. It was in school where I gained a sense of belief in myself. And it was in education and in my commitment to bettering myself where I started to gain these other traits like self-belief, like being empowered, like being unapologetically back, Black love for literature, love for the arts, being able to tell my friends from my community where I come from, like, nah, this isn't for me anymore. This is where I am. This is what I value. These are my priorities. And then when I started uh, working at an after school program with this Beacons program, I started to see this YMCA program. I started to really see like, hold up, my identity is also tied into how the youth see me. 
and being able to give them a sense of identity, a sense of self-love. Because once I started to develop that sense of identity and I moved into the classroom, now I was really pushed. And so now I'm finding myself, finding my purpose, my sense of identity, my sense of belonging in my ability to serve. And I recognize that I've been a servant my entire life. I wanted to make the people in my community feel better. I want to make my family feel better. And most importantly, I got to make myself feel better about myself. I had to learn how to love myself when I was imperfect. I had to learn how to be there for myself when, you know, you choose to value the right things and you see that people trying to pull you in different directions. And I had a strong group of people around me. And I think about young people and I say, the, the stronger their community and the cultivation of their identity and the cultivation of their mind that I can be a part of, the more I can pour into them, then then this is that's that's somebody who's already a step ahead of me because it took me that much longer to get it. So when we think about the mistakes I've made, when we think about the failures, when we think about my entire journey and where I live and where I come from, it all comes back to identity. The stronger I felt about myself and who I am and what I represent, the more unapologetically me I became. And the more unapologetic I want my young people to be as they go out into this world, because Baldwin said it best, right? Um, in his a talk to teachers, he told us, he said, the, the paradox in teaching is that we want people who question the world and question the society that they live in and question themselves and, and develop a sense of that, but we're threatened by that very Negro child that we're cultivating to be that. And it's like, I, I'm not threatened by that because that was me. And so I want them because this world already going to do enough to you. You got to come back to who am I? I think at every step of the way, all of us, everybody listening to me talk right now, anybody who's not listening to me talk right now, it all comes back to who am I? And the more clarity we have in those answers, the more grace we're willing to give ourselves, the more of an impact we have on ourselves, which means we have a greater impact on the world that we want. So Abdul, there were so many nuggets of wisdom in there and I've been writing a few of them down. Um, one thing that you said was you had to learn to love yourself even when you were imperfect. Yeah. I think that that's one of the hardest things that we have to do as humans. How yeah. did you do that? I, I, I just had to be comfortable with being alone. Like so many people, I, I can't speak for everybody else. I used to be so afraid of rejection. I used to be so afraid of failure. I used to be so afraid of making mistakes because I felt like that became my entire identity. If I'm rejected, then that's my entire identity, the guy that's rejected. If I make a mistake, the guy that makes a mistake. And then I realized like, at no stage in my life have I not made mistakes. At no stage in my life have I not been flawed or imperfect or knew enough to where I didn't need to learn more. Like I'm I'm always becoming, right? Like the, the thing we could take from Michelle Obama in any sense, right, is this, 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 this sense of assuredness that she has about herself. So when we hear that in somebody else, that you know what, it's okay if I'm not there yet. It's okay. And I had to learn to tell myself it's okay because my, my, my path through college wasn't traditional. It's okay. I'm going to be a teacher, but I barely graduated high school with a 1.7 GPA. That's okay. I want to be somebody who loves the world, even though I may have hurt myself or hurt others in the past unintentionally. That's okay. I can, I can, I can rewrite my story or I can continue to write my story. And for anybody out there who's making mistakes, that's okay. You got this new title as a CEO and you feel flawed and you feel like you're never doing enough. That's okay. All you can do is control what's right in front of you. And I think when we really focus on that, we take our power back. And I'm just, I'm just a firm believer in people taking their power back. I really appreciate your honesty and your answers. And I, I also loved um, your statement that you learned to give yourself grace. And I'm going to ask a question um, to both Leanne and um, Abdul. And Kristen, if you could just flip back one, one slide for the moment. So I, I've heard you both talk about the journeys that you've taken professionally and personally. 
that have brought you to the places where you are. What have you learned that has enabled you to better promote racial equity within the classroom, your own classroom and the classrooms of others? That's a great question. Well, I've, I've, first of all, I've learned the importance of honoring who you are, um, honoring all voices, right? And not making judgments about who's and how our voices show up. And so um, for me, like looking, I think another thing too is really looking at the assets that particularly our students of color bring to the, to the table. And so getting my mind out of this deficit way of thinking um, it took a while, but I got to the point where I don't even talk about like achievement gaps. Um, Cause I kept, when I would think about that terminology, I was like, what does that do to the psyche of non-white students when we're constantly comparing them to white students? What does that do to you? Like, and I'm like, no, that's not even going to be something that it's going to be in my vocabulary. And so, uh, terminology, language, um, to me, is super, super important. And showing up, right? Showing up as my flawed <clears throat> self and understanding that even in this skin that I'm in, that um, I don't have all the answers, right? And so I'm gonna make mistakes, but owning that, um, and like just really being real, I'm, it's really important for me for like what you see really is what you get. And students um, know that, they need to know that, that I'm not gonna be one way today and another way tomorrow, but like I'm gonna show up um, as Leanne Stevens every single day. And I'm going to value who you are. I'm not gonna make judgments on where you've come from. I'm not going to hold you hostage for your, by your story. I'm going to know you. I'm going to know who you are. I'm going to know your story, but I'm not going to hold you hostage with, by your circumstances. And so that's really important for me um, to really know students and have that relationship with them. And so because oftentimes I've heard teachers say, oh, I have a relationship with X, Y, and Z, but then that student would tell me, I don't mess with that teacher. And so um, for me, it's like really understanding who that student is and that it's, it's this, it's not this top down, but it's a circular uh, relationship and that letting students know that we are in this together. Like I am here for you so you can be your best self and I will believe in you when nobody else believes in you, even when you don't believe in yourself, I'm gonna believe in you until you see the brilliance that I see. And so um, really that to me is like at the core of this racial equity work that for that in my, in my experience. Thank you, Leanne. I think that's beautiful. And I think um, Leanne, you, Dr. Dr. Leanne, I'm gonna just keep throwing that flex out there. Um, I think that you touched on something that is super important. It's it's about the, the the students. Like at the end of the day, right? Like that's all that matters are them. Like I think we need to sit with that though, because somehow in education, and I've seen it because of being able to be a teacher of the year, people's ego can get in the way of what's most important. And we revert back to like bad habits. And you see that play out in regards to compassion, empathy, and selflessness. And so when you ask, how does that tie to race and equity and network, 
I'm driven by the students because I'm, I have such a strong personality and I'm so stubborn at times and I'm so opinionated, as y'all could tell, um, that I, I want to be grounded in humility as much as I can be. And the only way for me to be driven by that and grounded in humility is for me to, to be tied to values. And that's why I say identity is so important to me because my identity helps me shape what I value. And I try to align my words, my actions, my thoughts, my beliefs, my reactions with what I value. But I also align my courage and my sacrifices with what I value. And so when we talk about race and equity, if my students in their sense of identity and them being loved and loving themselves and feeling that they're allowed to make mistakes and that no one is perfect, if I see anything in the way of that, we're not going to, that's not going to sit with me. And that means that I'm willing to sacrifice relationships. That means I'm willing to sacrifice moving up ladders. That means that I'm willing to sacrifice friendships. That means that I'm willing to sacrifice money because what matters to me most are my babies, my students. And so that takes a certain amount of courage. It's easy for me to sit in a room of people who think just like me and who are in the same position as me and talk about how this policy doesn't fit our school or how this don't work. It's a whole other thing to face my CEO and tell him this policy doesn't work and it's not what's best for my babies and whatever you got to say, like, I'm not doing that. Like, because I believe in, in this and I think we get in the way of that. We think, oh, I'm just this teacher or oh, I'm only a first year, I'm only a second year, I've only been doing it. No, you know. You know when something isn't sitting right in your spirit and with your values. So when I see my babies being harped on by by teachers, white teachers or black teachers or whatever type of teacher, I'm going to be there to stand up for them in the name of what I value. So it's not even hard. (laughs) It's just necessary. It's just the necessary work that has to happen and we need to be courageous. And so if that means that I have to be courageous and that means that I am sacrificed for that, then that makes it that much easier for that younger teacher who says, you know what? People used to tell me I talk too much, but I hear you talk and I'm driven. I'm inspired by that. Cool. Good. Right. Because that's at the end of the day, you just want to have you want to be of use and we can be of use in a million different ways. And my greatest way to impact this world is to ask myself, who am I? What do I have to contribute and to be driven steadfastly, stubbornly, unapologetically by that? And we have to just move more in this direction of courageous sacrifice, driven by values, not driven by ego, but driven by what we value most. Thank you, Abdul. And there are some fantastic comments in the chat box. Um, Kimberly Worthy just said, sometimes you have to be subversive in order to be successful for your students. And I think that all of us here who are teachers know exactly what she means by that. Um, Can I add one more thing to that? Yes, please. Because we question ourselves. We'll, we'll, we'll get pushback. And then now this friendship that I thought I had from somebody I really thought that I respected and looked up to, I see that as I'm growing and my beliefs are becoming my own, you know, I'm not in alignment all the time with, with this collective mindset. And it's like, that cannot sit well inside of you. And so you go home like, is it me? Right. The way you answer that is like, what, what, hold up. Let me not even question myself. Let me go back to the value. Right. And then right. Like, oh, it's not me. And I'm going I'm to keep doing what I'm doing because I know what I'm committed by. I'm committed for. And it takes exactly what you said earlier. It takes that that sense of self-identity, that knowing who we are to be able to find that core of strength to do exactly what you just said. And so, Kristen, um, if we could move on to the next slide, I'm just trying to be mindful of time. Leanne, um, in your new position, you will advocate for Black, Brown, and Indigenous students in advanced placement classes, IB classes, honors classes, and this is work that you're returning to. So this is work that you did before, Mm -hmm. and you're returning to it, and you based your dissertation on this work. Right. Why make this change? Um, So, wow, I felt such a pull on my heart to return to this role 
uh, those classes, and, and we all know, are historically and predominantly white by design. Uh, there are white protected spaces. And too many of our Black, Brown, and Indigenous scholars didn't see a place for themselves in those classes. And I also, I wasn't seeing an expectation of excellence throughout my building for them. And so I would see it in pockets, right? You, I mean, there are some teachers who are uh, on this webinar, in this webinar, who would hold that, but I wouldn't see it throughout, permeated throughout my building. Um, and that was really disheartening for me. And so to be able to have the opportunity to go back and do this role again, this position again, I'm ecstatic. And so I, I also went back to like the impact of when I did have, when I did do the high achievement program, when I was the coordinator, um, the impact that it had on my former students. And I felt like that impact was missing, that I wasn't seeing that currently. And some of the um, impacts that I would see, one of them was empowerment. So some of them described in their experiences with the high achievement program. And so like based on my research and my research was, a ph was phenomenological. So it was based on lived experiences. And so they emphasize like how the high achievement program and I like help them to be comfortable with being the only one or a few students of color in their classes. And so um, that was super important for me. I wanted them to know, yeah, you belong. <laughs> you belong in this space. You are brilliant. Don't let anyone tell you anything different, um, differently. You belong in that space. And one of my former, one of my former black scholars who actually, she's now a PhD candidate. Um, she said that it was probably the first experience she had of an adult or mentor empowering her, giving um, rather than taking over so that she could succeed. She said that, um, in her words, giving me the tools to do what I needed to do as opposed to doing it for me. Mm. And so she had an experience with a teacher and it wasn't a positive experience at all. And so she and I would, we would sit down and we'd have conversations about it. And, uh, and I didn't step in. I was like, what do you want me to do? Um, here's how you can approach it. And she reminded me that it didn't, uh, that I didn't step in and have a conversation with the teacher until it got to the point of kind of like no return. And so she said, yeah, that was the first time that she had actually been empowered. And so when she went to college, she said she knew what to look for in a mentor because she had had that experience with me. And so she said, I looked for that. She said, I actually tried to create my own little high achievement program. Um, and so that's what like the hope is, what we do in our school spaces, that that will transfer into like outside of, outside of the building into other spaces as they continue to matriculate through our system. And it doesn't necessarily mean they have to go on to college. They can, you know, we can go into like a career right away, but that they are able to know that I can advocate for myself. And so that was like really important for me. Another impact was that sense of belonging through racial affinity because we met in racial affinity. And so Affinity groups affirm students' identities while equipping, equipping them to find their place within a school's community, thus highlighting the need for our Black Indigenous um, scholars of color in predominantly white educational environments or spaces to have a space where they don't feel isolated because being one of only um, or a few in a predominantly white space can be a challenge where um, an affinity group can provide a sphere of safety. The relationships that are built through race-based affinity groups provide a space where feelings can be shared and self-esteem boosted. So it was not really just the academic piece of it that I was offering support, but it was also um, their social emotional well-being that I was offering support for. And a lot of times when we think of students in those classes, we're like, oh, they're gonna struggle academically. More of it was their struggle was like for people to see that they 
mattered, that they had a voice, that they were intelligent. Like that was more of the struggle. And so my work was to constantly affirm their brilliance and have them create their own standard of excellence. And so uh, one of the comments that uh, one of the students made when she was talking about like being in racial affinity, she said it felt like a weight was lifted off her shoulders. She said it was like once you were in that space that was designated for us, you felt safe. She said she could finally breathe and didn't have to pretend to be someone or act a certain way. A lot of her students are holding their breath and waiting to exhale. Mm. Um, and so she said she didn't have to be perceived a certain way by others. She said she could relax, she could share her experiences without being judged or having to be super careful about the way she said things. Um, that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure and you still, you have to navigate academically and you got all of this on you as well. Um, and she said, she said, you understand that these people know what you are going through when it comes to being a person of color, trying to achieve in higher level classes. And it felt like a moment where you could finally be yourself and not worry about all these other little things. And another impact I felt like this high achievement program has, it helped them navigate school culture um, when we talk about expect, centered around expectations. And so we know if culture reflects how we act on a daily basis, then school culture would have to reflect how we act within the confines of the school setting. School culture sets the norms and expectations of the school. And so some of their thoughts, like they conveyed thoughts that there wasn't an expectation that they could or would achieve at high levels. The lack of expectations for them to achieve lay with their white peers as well as their teachers. One of them said, I think the only way that I could describe it is kind of a passive aggressive like environment because people know you're there, but they don't acknowledge you, but you will be acknowledged when it comes to negative things. So if certain students of color act out or do things, it's almost as if it's a representation of me and I have to carry that burden. But it's like, once I do something that's positive, it's almost shocking. Like they can't believe it. Um, this particular student wrote an article for Education Post and she said so many teachers came up to her that she had never even met and they were like oh i read your piece it was amazing and it got to be overwhelming for her mm -hmm. um and you know this is just her experience so this you know this is not to say that this would be everybody's experience but for her she said it was like there was so much attention on me almost to the point where it was uncomfortable because it was almost like i can't believe you were capable of doing that this is kind of like she said these two polar opposites where you carry the burden of all these stereotypes that people already put on you. And once you achieve something positive, even if it shouldn't be such a shock and you shouldn't get so much recognition for it, like an average white student wouldn't, all that attention makes you uncomfortable. And she just, she said, it's just constantly fighting between not being a stereotype, not being praised for things I should be expected to do and not falling into the background and being invisible. She said, it's always a fight between the three. And she's like, it's like what you see at other high schools, like students of color are expected to perform worse. And when you do perform well, it's like an individual thing. Like you're the good student of color and you're going to go far when everyone else isn't. And so those are just some examples that came from my research, but I still see the same things playing out currently. So I knew like I needed to get back to that role. Yeah. I th I'm, I'm trying to write down so many things that you're saying, but one thing that I'm taking away um, from what you've just said is that you are going to be working to find ways to not allow students to become hostages of what teachers expect the students' stories to be. Absolutely. And I know you and I have had some personal conversations about the reasons why you're going back to do this work. I, and I don't even like to use the term going back. Right. Because you're not going back, you're going forward. Right. And as you go forward, you're taking everything that you've learned from your work as a racial equity coach with you. Absolutely. And what a blessing you will be to those students. And, and so, Leanne, thank you. Thank you. What? Okay. All right, I'll just go. Come on. 
Like, Dr. Stevens, that's why. That's why. That's why. And now I want to move to this absolutely magnificent quote um, from Abdul's piece in the paper. And I'm going to actually read it. I know that you can all read it yourselves, but I'm going to read it out loud. Education has been the only real means to break down oppressive systems and create opportunities for a marginalized people residing in communities where voices of the brightest and most determined have been rendered silent. I actually printed this out on a piece of paper and have it hanging in my office, Abdul. Um, that's how, how much it touched my soul. Do you think that education is working as a means to raise those voices? As, as fully as it should or could? No. <laughs> and why? And it's because of comfort and convenience. Like, this education was grounded in institutional and structural racism. It's grounded in that. Like, the very foundation of education was to give it to the white children who they felt most needed religion. It was not meant for this black boy who to, to, to empower his brain and start his own business. They was afraid of that, right? Hence CC Black Wall Street, right? Like, I do not believe that education is working as a means to raise those voices because of the institutional and structural racism that has inflicted our entire mindsets and communities and our world beliefs. I believe that is several fold. One contributing factor is the history of education. Another is the convenience of what it would, the convenience of what right now brings for so many people who have been invested in education, lifelong educators. And another reason is because of ego to believe that, you know what, what I've created has not worked and is not working for those who I needed to work best for. Um, another one is profitability. Your bottom line isn't the same if you are really trying to educate all because to give everyone quality access and with even within the same district requires a lot more funding. So you see drastic inequities within schools that are in the same district that probably are 12, 14, 16 blocks apart. Um, and then the mindset and belief, it's too hard, it's overwhelming. They don't need that right now. You look at the conversation that's happening right now around education. We're afraid to educate the ones who need it most because it requires to address our ego. It requires us to address things that make us comfortable. And it requires us to work a thousand times harder when we feel like we already are not working hard enough, when we already feel like we're overworked. You see that, and I don't mean teachers, I mean leaders. I mean the policymakers. I mean the ones in charge. I mean the deans of educational programs. I mean the program directors. I mean, the, the lobbyists who are helping decide where this funding goes. I mean, community organization leaders. I mean, board chairs who sit on boards of schools or institutions yet have nothing to do with understanding the academics of the programs that they're in charge of being on the board of. Um, I'm talking to community members who fund, who fund these private schools and throw money there but can't see how this school that lacks computers is deserving of them conditional. There's so many inequities in education right now that it's better to keep the voices of the marginalized silence for all of those reasons than it is to revamp the entire system. I mean, yes. This is frightening. Um, this is truly frightening. We're at a war, right? Like it's a, it's a war. Um, I was listening to, I was reading this article on this doctor, and I want to say he's in this small town in Mississippi, and he deals with like surgeries and amputations and things like that. And what he noticed was the disproportionate amount of African American patients who were getting their feet or legs amputated due to diabetes. 
and how you would contrast that with their white counterparts who were receiving remit like receiving interventions before it got to the point of amputation and how the density of the African American population in that community was drastically different than that white population, and how that when he wanted to perform scans and, and run interventions on black patients, he struggled with getting the resources that he needed, and doctors in that community weren't willing to help him with those patients. And so he always wore like fatigues because he felt like he was in a war to save lives. In a lot of cases, we're in a war to save lives. I am not here if there were not soldiers on the front lines and generals who were commanding the troops to educate this young man, give him what he deserves. Yet so many of my friends didn't receive that same opportunity because I was one of those students in the Leanne's classroom, in the advanced placement classroom, one of the only black faces, the only black face. I was the only black face in my Shakespeare class in college. I was the only black face in my British literature class, my war literature two class. And I had to speak up. I had to work that much harder. And I had to recognize very early on that I'm going against this entire system, like regardless of how we feel about it, it's right, it's wrong, but what do you do about it? Right. Like everybody can empathize or sympathize with it, but do something. Right. And until the system does something for me so that I don't have to fight against everybody, I'm a fight and I'm going to strengthen my muscles, my mental muscle, my heart muscle, my spiritual muscle. I'm going to strengthen every muscle inside of my fiber and outside of my fiber of being in order to be able to withstand everything that's coming at me from racist teachers, from racist leaders, from structural systems that are designed to oppress me because those do exist and people are afraid to have these conversations. And this is the first time that it's become trendy to have these types of conversations. Like this is a convenient thing right now. And my, my goal is to see this not be a convenience. I wanna see you be on the front line when it's an inconvenient opportunity, when it requires sacrifice, when it, be, when it requires courage. Amen. That's all I can say. Amen. Um, Abdul and Leanne, and Abdul, I know that we had this conversation a couple of nights ago um, with another group of teachers, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on COVID, but I would like to spend a little bit of time because we have a few minutes. How Will you prepare or assist your students as they return to school in processing what is happening in our country around race, inequity, discrimination, protest? How will you help your students make sense of things that don't always make a whole lot of sense? even to adults right now? You know, I think for me, is just giving them the space, giving them the space and the time to be able to have the conversations and not feeling like we have to rush to get something else done. Um, they have to be able to engage um, because several, quite a few of my students have been involved in protests. Yeah. And, um, and so, they're coming in even with that trauma, right? And so we have to give them that space. And so I'm hoping that we're not going to be in such a rush and feel like we're wasting time if we do that, um, you know, or that we have to get to whatever the academics or we have to try to act like nothing happened. There is no way we can do that because they know something happened and i don't know like i i can't give like a time of like how much time it's going to take but i believe whatever time they need because it really is about them it is so about them and if we really believe that students are at the center because we say that a lot you know students are at the center um and i see so much i see so many adults at the center and not the students, but we want to say it. We like to say it a lot. And so if we really believe that they are at the center, then we're going to make sure that they are and that they're able to process and have these conversations um, and feel safe about it. 
right? And so set up parameters where no, you can speak your truth because your truth makes up who you are, makes up your lived experience. And your truth and my truth may not even be the same, right? But it makes up who you are. And yes, you are allowed to bring that truth to the space and we can have uh, those conversations. And I'm, I'm gonna listen. That's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna listen. And so many of your students, both of your students, have been at the epicenter of this, just given where you are geographically. And I, Leanne, I love what you're saying about giving space, giving time, allowing these conversations to happen, because they have to. Abdul, is there anything you want to add? Everything Leanne said. And when we talk, and what I mean by everything that Leanne said is just that her her comment, is, her statement is just grounded in the importance of of engaging and sparking dialogue and discourse around issues and ideas and principles and values. And for me, the other piece that I'm recognizing is as equally as important because I recognize it in my own journey. So for everybody, one thing that's happening in this greater conversation around race are the the the, the sub conversations and I, I hate to say sub as if they're not as important but one of those is misogyny being misogynistic and recognizing like while i'm advocating and speaking up and talking about blackness and and what it means to be a black male I got to really educate myself on the privilege and the power that I have as a man and the privilege and power I have as a black man. And so as much as people are listening to me, I'm finding myself sitting and listening to others and being intentional about how I sit and listen and connect. And that's a part of the work. It's, it's not what I'm going to get credit for and nor should I, nor should I. And I, I take that sense of like open vulnerability with y'all to recognize how misogynistic I am as a man and that I'll always be that and continue to unlearn that. And how do I live in a society that empowers our, our collective, specifically our women and specifically our black women? I, I'm learning a lot and I'm reading a lot and I'm conversing with people. And so then when it comes to the classroom, as much as I want them to listen, I want them to learn. Like Baldwin speaks on the importance of rights and responsibilities. And we all have the right for our voices to be heard, but we have a responsibility to use our words wisely and, and to in, increase our knowledge and our competency and our wisdom and our perspective. And so I want to, as much as I'm participating as a listener in the conversation, I want to give my students, students resources that go back to the beginning of our plight as an African-American people so that they can see the history, so that they can understand how these things have played out since the beginning of time. And when we explore those and I'm listening to them, I'm going to speak, but my, my speaking won't be answers. My speaking will be questions that I have for myself, questions that I'm exploring because it all comes back to being transparent and vulnerable with them at the same time. Like, I don't have the answers. The very things I'm asking y'all to question are the very things I'm questioning myself and navigating myself. And so when I'm able to model that I don't have 100% clarity and that there is not clarity and that I'm constantly learning and that I have to recognize my power and that I do have a power and I want my young men in my class to recognize their power, I want my young women in the classes to recognize how people are trying to take their power. And it's, it's, it's a lot of learning happening right now, you know? Can I add something? It is. Yes, Leanne, go. I appreciate that so much. Thank you so much. Because, um, and I know we've had this conversation before, but I, I, I do think of like all these women who have been involved in movements who have not gotten credit, right? Black Panther movement. Um, and I look a lot of the, my students who have been protesting, who have gotten arrested, um, who've gotten beaten up by the police have been females. And so, um, so I thank you for that. And I thank you also for what you said about questions, because um, it always sticks with me when I went to hear Angela Davis uh, speak at, in Minneapolis and, she, and someone said, 
at the end, okay, as educators, what can we do? Like, what would you, what would be one thing you would tell us to do? And she said, um, to teach your students how to ask questions and to teach them how to formulate, to teach others how to formulate questions. And she said, that is like the best thing that you can do as an educator. And I think about how she said that, and I think about how I'm in spaces where if students are asking questions, teachers get annoyed. And so, um, but the learning comes in the questions. And so I appreciate that so much, Abdul. Thank you. Abdul, I appreciate it as well. Thank you for raising that. Um, we are at eight o'clock and I'm going to ask Kristen to put us into breakout rooms. And some of you will be in a breakout room with Leanne and some of you will be in a breakout room with Abdul. And you'll both be discussing the same question. What advice would you give to people who face organizational barriers to actively fighting for equity? So think about what that means, those organizational barriers to actively fighting for equity. And so Kristen, if you could work your magic. So, but the question was, what advice would you give to people who face organizational barriers to actively fighting for equity? You know, it's real interesting because my school district, we're the only district in the nation who has the model that we have, where every single teacher, um, every licensed staff member, so it could be a nurse, social worker, psychologist, that they all have a racial equity instructional coach, nice. uh, whether they want one or not, because not everybody wants one. But oh, that's all right. <laughs> right. But they um, have one. And so, but it started with teachers. It started with teachers saying, you know what, what we're doing right now is not working. And we need we need we need a change. We need to do something different. And so um, I don't think that it would have happened the way that it did if it had been administration. Um, coming in and saying, look, this is what you all are going to do. I think there would have been, I mean, there was already some pushback, but uh, the majority of the teachers were like, yeah, this is what we want. Um, we want to be coached on racial equity. We want to be coached on our beliefs, right? We want to be coached on um, how our instruction impacts what we believe. And um, we want to be coached on race and how race matters and how we're going to have conversations about it and how we're going to uh, look at it, look at our curriculum, right? It's not uh, anymore where it's this initiative or this little side piece or whatever. Mm -hmm. Everything that we do, we have to look at it through a lens of racial equity. We don't have a choice. And so, We've been doing this for probably, so I've been in it for five. I think we've had racial equity coaches. I think it'll be about eight years now. Um, and so and now every kind of, teacher has one? Yes. Yes. Leanne, how are you all trained? Um, so there's a, like, the, so the criteria, first of all, you have to have a proven record of success with um, black, brown, and indigenous students. So that's that's one mm -hmm. um you've had to like you have to be a classroom uh teacher because you're going in and you're doing observations and so that's super important as well um, and then because we partner with pacific education group we've been trained in um beyond diversity so courageous conversations about race beyond diversity we've been trained in um mindful inquiry with uh Le and so, I mean, it looks like Lee Munwa, but he said you pronounce it Lee Munwa. And, uh, and then we have various like uh, trainings that we go to. So that's, and that's a really good, cause that question comes up a lot. Like, so everybody has this foundation when they take on this role, you have to, you have to. Um, and, and there's a lot of trust that comes with this because I know when I first started doing, started being a racial equity coach and I'd go into the classrooms right away, 
like this wall like is she coming in here what's she coming in here to do to judge me or you know say that i'm racist or whatever and so what i had to do was really say you know what i'm in here because i want you to be the best you and so i'm going to partner with you so that you can show up as your best self for your students mm -hmm. and so just like building that that trust with them um but again it had to be like orchestrated by the te teachers had to have a buy-in and so we don't have a director of equity and inclusion right because when, when you do that to me that's a barrier because it becomes one person's responsibility so really it's all of our responsibility and our um, mission is to build the will skill and the capacity to disrupt systemic um racism in our district so th that that's part of one uh, that's one of our goals and so um because no one can say it's not my it's not my job well yes it is yeah it is it's everybody's can you repeat that last your your goal <laughs> oh to build the will skill and capacity to disrupt um systemic racism i would like to mm. add something um to comment on top of what you just shared dr stevens my name is Chantel Chapman and I work for the military. I'm an educator and I'm basically a flight commander responsible for educating our educators. Okay. So within the military um, community, of course, we have the hierarchy and the ranking structure. And what I've learned um, in response to the question is, what advice would I give um, to fight against the organizational barriers? use those barriers, use those structures to your advantage. Turn those obstacles into opportunities. Chain of command is very, very huge, very, very um, influential in the military community. And so a lot of times when things happen, you have to go through those chain of commands. And of course, there's going to be the different biases that you're faced with as you're going through those um, experiences. However, educators, and um, parents have a very strong relationship. And so if you build on those relationships, you already have a platform and a network that is gonna advocate for you in behalf of the children automatically, effortlessly. So what I've learned out of everything is instead of always um, focusing on what's not working, think of what is already established, what is working, and use turn that obstacle, turn that barrier into an opportunity. And amongst those parents are high-ranking officials just the same. Their children are um, attending our schools, attending our programs, and their 06s, commanders, generals, brigadier generals, just the same. So it's just if you if you remove the emotion because the emotion of course is what motivates us and that's what drives us but if we remove the mo emotion give us just a few minutes to think clearly then we can use all of our resources that we have into opportunities and so it's I, i've been in the military working for the military for well over 23 years so of course it took me all of these 23 years to learn that but um i think it's a way i don't like to say fight but um, it's a way of fighting smarter um, instead of working harder. So I just wanted to share that. I don't know if it really applies in some of um, the situations of organizational barriers that you guys might experience, but I just want to share that from my experience. Thank you, Chantal. I think it, it absolutely applies because, um, and I'm so glad that you said that because not only did we have, the parents had to be on, on board mm -hmm. as well, and they had to understand that you're not losing right like everybody gains and so i think when we talk about racial equity work somebody they think like well if we do this then then you're taking away from like my child so if we think of like giving everybody what they exactly. what they need well then now you're going to take away from my child and so they had to understand that no this benefits every every child Absolutely. right and we all do better we all do better and so our mayor um is on board in our city um, we have oh. and one of the local churches, they're doing racial equity, equity work um, in their space. They actually have me as one of their advisors, as one of their advisors. And so I appreciate what you said, because to me, that's, that's a way of facing those, right? 
Exactly. Who, who else can we get in community around racial equity work in our, in our spaces? Exactly. And everybody has their own level of um, power of influence. You know, they have their own audience that they are interacting with, engaged with. And sometimes people need to hear, they can hear the same thing from five different people, but it's going to be delivered differently. And they won't really listen to it until the sixth person says it, but it really was the same message. And that's okay, because everybody's not going to communicate the exact same for everybody to get it. So the more people that you have that are saying something of the same, giving the same message ultimately, but they deliver it a different way, just think of the masses that you're going to reach. So I think- Thank um, you. Thank you. Anyone else have any thoughts? I have a question for you, Leanne. You said a minute ago that it's it can be challenging to bring up the topic of racial equity with groups that may not have asked for it specifically. Can you just elaborate on that? How do you get that conversation moving in in a productive way with groups that might not necessarily be ready for it or might be resistive to it? So that's really so here's the like my experience now. Um, because we have been doing this work for quite a long time, it's really uncomfortable now if you're not talking about race in my school district. Uh, if you're not bringing race up, it's super uncom- uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And so, but when to like when we talk about building like the capacity, you just you start with teachers who are willing, and so then they start to influence. Um, other teachers and so when they're having meetings they're starting to interrupt some of the nonsense that's being discussed and so that's how you actually get it started so that um because you do you do have people who are resistant i i coach somebody who told me he thought this was a bunch of bs and so what i do is i don't get angry about that right what i do is um use some mindful inquiry and i'll say oh okay Tell me more about that. What do you mean by that? Well, 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 well then he backs off. Like he doesn't, he just, he, he thinks he's going to shut down the conversation by saying that. And so getting on the other side of that, I think is super important, particularly for those who are resisting, like what, asking them questions, what is your fear? Like, uh, well, I don't think it's going to work, but what, but if it could work, what would it look like? And so um, so that, so pushing back, but doing it with like loving accountability, you know, so I'm going right. to push back, but I'm not going to, I'm not going, I'm not going to be harsh about, it. I'm not going to like be judgmental. Cause I could have very well been really angry with him. What do you mean? It's BS. Let me tell you something. My life is, um, but that, that's not going to work. Right. So right. I'm just like, okay, tell me what you mean about that. Give me more information. Um, I'll think about that. Okay. So are they, uh, are they accountable some kind of way? Are the teachers accountable? To- yes, they are. They are accountable. So they do, we do professional um, development plans and in their plans they have to have, um, race has to be tied into that. And they have to um, have a right of racial equity purpose. Um, so each department had to write a racial equity purpose. And so they are, are they held accountable enough? I mean, for me, it's like never enough, but, right. um, but anyway, but yeah, there, um, there is accountability. And there has to be, cause you know, students, students, students hold them accountable too. And my superintendent, he's like, look, this is what we're about. So you either on board or you need to find somewhere else. What's the name of your district? St. Louis Park Schools in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. Nice. We have less than a minute anymore. I was just going to comment that in my experience, I, I, um, I'm an equity trainer in my district and I do it, do it all over the place. But in my experience, when it comes to getting people who aren't ready for the conversation, I always start with the data. And I say, well, according to all your data. I can tell everybody had a great conversation 
because no one came back to the main room until literally they all the closed. Last second. <laughs> <laughs> the very last second. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I've asked um, Leanne and Abdul to share some thoughts from their breakout sessions. And then I've asked Dr. Mons to close us out with some final thoughts of her own from our conversations this evening. Mm -hmm. So Leanne and Abdul, who'd like to go first? I would like to go first so that Leanne can have the last word. Um, I, in our group, we talked about a few different ideals inside of it. One, the first is the importance of recognizing just how dynamic and how influential conversations around race are and how 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 problematic our systems and structures are. We have to recognize and first accept how bad things are in order to actually get to the root of what we're facing, which is a societal racial deficit in, in understanding how to educate and empower black and brown children. Um, and then we got to discuss a little bit of what it's like within our community. When you choose like a Dr. Mons to separate from the collective mindset and say, you know what, I'm going to step away from valuing all of these perceptions you hold about me, especially as a black mom and a black woman in regards to thinking because I'm not accepting anything less for my children, that somehow I am problematic or I have an attitude or that I'm angry. And then having to also address that from a society standpoint, but then also within your own community. Like, who do you think you are to not be a part of this? Or who do you think you're better than? Or things of that nature where you have to fight constantly, battling this sense. And then just touched on that as well, this constant sense of battling even your own self, and especially for people who may be mixed race, who are both black and white. Where do I fit? How do I help my students explore where they fit? How do we converse? How do we sit with this? And it all comes back to just this need to converse and really influence the top. Because these issues, we can do as much as we want on the ground level, but at the end of the day, we're going to be working against ourselves if the leaders, if the people in charge who are predominantly white men are constantly in control of the narrative. So we have to address that and we have to really talk about what does it mean to bring actionable change and we have to ask those tough questions and face these tough truths. Thank you, Abdul. Leanne. Um, so we talked about how do you use, like using the structures and barriers to your advantage um, how like educators and, and parents tend to have strong relationships. So how do you leverage those uh, to get the work done? Think of um, what is working instead of like what isn't working, um, which is a way of fighting. Um, also talked about uh, when you have people who are, when you have these barriers, right? Start with the data, um, how you, you know, what does that data look like? And so you're gonna either respond um, with what you believe about black and brown students. You, you know, do you believe that they, that they are less intelligent? Well, no one's really gonna say that, right? So now what do we do then with this data that, that's in front of us? How do we move forward? How do we make this work? Um, also when people say, uh, well, this won't work. Well, you can push back, you know, and not be com combative or anything, but just say like, but if it would work, what would it look like? If you could do this, what would that look like? Um, and so that's, I think those are some of the thoughts that I had. Thank you, Leanne. And thank, thank you. Thank you all. Um, so Catherine, are you ready for me? I was just going to give two quick logistical directions before we turn it to you. So one is, um, this is recorded, so I'll be sending the recording to everyone who registered for the webinar, whether they were able to, per to physically participate or not. And secondly, at nine o'clock, you're going to get another email asking you to complete a post-webinar survey. Again, two questions. 
Again, I promise less than one minute. And Dr. Mons and I would greatly appreciate your making the time to do that. Thank you all for being here and Dr. Mons, take us home. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you again, Dr. Stevens and Mr. Wright. What a, what a delight. Um, so there are a few things I'd like to maybe leave in terms of uh, kind of next steps. And so in our session, there was a conversation even around data because we have our experiences and certainly the work that Dr. Stevens has done with her dissertation and her qualitative work. Um, so our funder, Thurgood Marshall College Fund, just released uh, a week ago, in fact, on August 6th, a data dashboard. Uh, the Gallup Foundation is, has worked with TMCF and has collected uh, three years of data, and it's available. And so one of the next steps for the take action, we hope that there are teachers on the call who would love to engage and maybe possibly an iteration, another iteration of a similar kind of white paper. Because again, what we've learned this evening is there's just such a wealth of experiences and knowledge that is, um, and, and activities that are being, uh, that are taking place at the classroom level that we think adds value to the narrative when we start talking about educational opportunities for those in fragile communities. And so I am going to, uh, again, say thank you, and I'm going to yield to Dr. Uh, Joyce Payne, if she's still on the call. Uh, and Dr. Payne, if there are any comments you would like to share on behalf of the vision that you had for Thurgood Marshall College Fund and the vision that you have uh, for the work that the research centers are doing across the three institutions. I, I won't bore the... Um... <laughs> the audience with, with that background, I would simply say that this has been very informative for me. Uh, all I can think about through all of these conversations is that we had a lot of work to do. We now have the possibility of having a teacher as the first lady of this country. I don't want to be political, too political, but in fact, if, if Jill Biden is there, she has already made a commitment to, uh, to put the education high on the list of priorities. Uh, we don't value our teachers enough, and I'm not sure we even value education sufficiently. So when we think about these issues, uh, it, it seems to me that um, one of the, the speakers talked about building a coalition within the, within the school system. And you have to build uh, relationships so that you have a group voice uh, when you raise the issues of, of equity. It's a tough issue to talk about, but we've got to deal with it. We also have to um, educate children uh, not to be racist, uh, whether we're educating black, brown, or white children. Uh, it's our responsibility to help them understand the world in which we live in. And um, so I just think we have to value teachers, we have to value education, and I'm hoping that the Thurgood Marshall Fund can do a better job at, uh, at making that case to the Congress and making that case to the new administration that I hope we will have. Thank you so much for allowing me to participate. I did have one other interruption uh, on a couple of occasions, and, but I did hear most of the conversation and, uh, and really appreciate each one of you participating and bringing your views to this very much needed conversation. And thank you, Dr. Mark, you're doing a fantastic job. Thank you all, and Catherine, um, take it away. You have been a wonderful audience. And in closing, I do certainly want to recognize my team. I see Joy Jones, who's the Outreach and Program Coordinator on the call, as well as Dr. Brittany Gatewood, who's our postdoc researcher, and we look forward to uh, working with you, uh, Catherine, and your, your teachers in the national, and the teachers of the year that have worked on this project. So thank you again, and have a good evening. Be well. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Mons.